Exodus 33, 1 through 11. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Thus ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Please be seated. Let's pray together. <clears throat> O God, thy main plan and the end of thy will is to make Christ glorious and beloved in heaven where he is now ascended, where one day all the elect will behold his glory and love and glorify him forever. Though here we love him but a little, may this be our portion at last. In this world you have given us a beginning. One day it will be perfected in the realm above. You have helped us to see and know Christ Though obscurely, to take him, receive him, to possess him, love him, to bless him in our hearts, mouths, and lives. Let us study and stand for discipline and all the ways of worship out of love for Christ and to show our thankfulness, to seek and know his will from love, to hold it in love, and daily to care for and keep this state of heart. You have led us to place all our nature and happiness in oneness with Christ, in having heart and mind centered on him only in being like him, in communicating good to others. This is our heaven on earth. But we need the force, energy, impulses of your spirit to carry us on the way to our Jerusalem. Here it is our duty to be as Christ in this world, to do what he would do, to live as he would live, to walk in love and meekness. Then he would be known, then we would have peace in death. Lord, as we now expound your word, we pray that you would reveal to us more of the glory of Christ as your word is preached, may it awaken affections in our hearts. We pray that you would bless the preaching of your word unto the conversion of sinners and the edification of your saints. May we see more of the glory of Christ as we consider his offices, particularly his office of prophet. Lord Jesus, our great prophet, teach us now. Open our minds that we may understand the scriptures. For we know that apart from your work in us by your spirit, this will all be to no avail. Grant that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened, that we may grow in grace and knowledge, in love for you and for our neighbor. We pray all of this in your holy and precious name. Amen. So we pick up again this morning in Exodus. And uh, since we often have visitors, I just want to recap a little bit of our purpose here uh, for why, why we preach the way that we do. We are absolutely convinced that scripture is powerful. As 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And so there is truly nothing else like scripture. It is the word of the true and living God, and 
all of it is profitable for us. And so we take God at his word, believing that the spirit of God will make the word of God come alive in the hearts of the people of God. And so all of scripture, not just the New Testament, is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Now, as we've been working through the book of Exodus, one thing I hope has become clear is that knowing the Old Testament background brings tremendous depth to our understanding of the New Testament. It is the Old Testament that provides us with many of the categories and concepts that are necessary for understanding the gospel. It's been very well said that if you only read the New Testament, it will only be a matter of time before you don't understand the New Testament. And so if working verse by verse through the text is new to you, here's at least the beginning of an explanation. This is rooted in our view of scripture. So with that introduction, let us look to God's holy word. We pick up our story again, and we are nearing the end of Exodus. God has delivered his people from slavery in Egypt, and he has brought them to Mount Sinai, where he delivered the law. But while Moses was up on the mountain receiving instruction from God, the people made an idol. They worshipped a golden calf, thus violating, breaking the very terms of the covenant that Moses was receiving up on the mountain. Moses pled for mercy on behalf of the people of Israel, and God did grant it, though there would be consequences. Last week we saw that when Moses came down to suppress the idolatry, uh, that 3,000 men were killed as the Levites performed their priestly duties. And then we saw also that God sent a plague on the people. And so chapter 33 now picks up the story here, and there is more bad news yet to come. Let's read together. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. So God begins by instructing Moses uh, to prepare the people to depart from Mount Sinai. Now, one of the first things we notice in this text is that God is still speaking of Israel as being Moses's people, right? Those whom Moses, whom you brought out of Egypt. Now, we saw that in the last chapter, it was actually Israel who began speaking this way. They talked about how Moses was the man who brought them out of Egypt, and they claimed, we don't know what has become of him. And so God then uh, continued that as they did not reference him, did not give credit to him as the one who delivered them. So now God continues to speak of the people of Israel as being Moses's people. Now we'll pick up on that in our next sermon as Moses will remind God, these are your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt. So we can see even from the way God refers to Israel that there is still some separation here. Things have not been uh, fully restored. Uh, and we will see more as we go through this text. So although God is going to be faithful to the promises that he swore to their fathers, right? He said, I will give the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Although God will fulfill that promise, he says, but I will not go with you. There is a change. Instead of the presence of the Lord continuing to be in the midst of the people, God says now he will send a messenger, an angel. And this would have been a created being. And it gets a little confusing throughout Exodus because sometimes angel of the Lord can refer to the presence of the Lord. And we've, we've had that discussion as we've worked through. But very clearly here, there's a change that is taking place. The angel that God sends will not be the presence of God himself. Uh, there, there's going to be a change. And so this angel will be with the people, but the special presence of God, which was one of their unique covenant blessings, 
has now been lost. And there is a grim irony here. What was it that the people came to Aaron asking for? What is the very thing that the people wanted when they came to Aaron and asked him to make an idol? Exodus 32 verse 1, they said, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. Make us gods who shall go before us. The very thing they wanted, the very thing they had, a God who went before them, is the very thing they lost. For the judgment now, God says, is that he will send an angel before them, but he himself will not go with them. Before this sin, they had the presence of God. They had a God, the God, going before them. But they were not satisfied with this. The people wanted things on their own terms, a God they could see, something tangible like what the nations had. And so God brought judgment on them. Their false God was ground into powder and scattered on the creek and they had to drink it. And they lost the blessing of the presence of the one true God. Now here's an important lesson. Sin never delivers. In this creation that we live in, this creation that God made, rebellion against him will never work out. (laughs) Rebellion against him will never bring us what we are hoping for. Rebellion against God always only leads to destruction. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you plant potatoes, don't expect apples. If you plant tomatoes, you won't get cucumbers. If you plant sin, you will not harvest blessing. God's commands truly do have our best interest at heart. We may think we have a better way. We may want something else. God's law may look to us like it's holding us back from happiness or fulfillment. But the fact is, God's law is protecting us. God's law serves our best interest. Now, I don't know what you're experiencing right now, but I do know that there are many, many voices in our world that tell us that God's ways are not the best ways. Perhaps all, the, all your friends and all the people in your life are telling you God's ways are old-fashioned. They are archaic, antiquated, behind the times maybe even barbaric. They may say that we've grown past this restrictive and backwards worldview. And that pull can be quite powerful, especially when it seems to confirm exactly what we think we're feeling on the inside. We may even have people telling us, why would God give you these desires if you weren't supposed to act on them? Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Scripture actually anticipates these exact kind of challenges. Scripture teaches us that since the fall, all mankind has been born with a sinful nature. That is, our desires go the wrong way. Many of the things that we feel we want are not things that God has created us for, but rather they are the result of sin working in us. As Jeremiah 17 verse 9 puts it, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so the old Disney advice, listen to your heart, turns out to be some pretty bad advice question comes down to this. Do you trust God? The wisdom of the world calls you to follow your own desires, to do what feels right, to do what is right in your own eyes. Will you trust the wisdom of the world? 
or will you follow God? Consider who God is. God is the creator. He is the one who made this world. He is the one who ordered this world the way that he saw fit. God knows best. God is the one who maintains galaxies, who keeps planets in their orbit. He has numbered the stars and calls them by name. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He designed every part of you from your heart to your liver down to the nuclei running your cells. You can trust in the wisdom and goodness of God. He cares for his people. There is one and only one path that leads to life. And as Israel learned, trying to do things their own way caused them to lose the very things that they were hoping to gain. Obey and trust in God. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 8 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Let's continue with Exodus. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. So God says his angel, his divine messenger, is going to drive out all the people who are presently living in the land of Canaan. Now, as we're talking about the wisdom of God coming under assault, this is one of the go-to passages that people will refer to. Uh, anybody who wants to discredit God will frequently point to things God does or commands, and they'll go, see, what kind of a God would do something like this? Well, the answer is a holy God. There is a vitally important truth in Scripture that most people in our modern world, and unfortunately many within the church, uh, seem to deny or don't understand, and that is this. The guilt of mankind before God. The reality in scripture is that all mankind since the fall has been guilty in the sight of God. Ask this question, to whom does God owe anything positive? Right? Outside of Christ, what do you deserve from God? The biblical answer is judgment. Now that truth is both humbling and vitally important for us to grasp. Once our hearts accept the fact that God does not owe any sinner anything good, and that he would be free at any time to bring judgment by taking the life of any sinner, no questions asked, when we accept that, we are then in a place where we will understand human guilt and we will find that a whole host of problems have been solved for us as we read through Scripture, because that is a core component of the biblical worldview. If we understand the weight of human guilt, we will then see the justice of God on display as he brings judgment on sin. And Scripture says specifically that this is what he was doing with the land of Canaan. God explains to Israel in Deuteronomy 9 uh, that it is not because of their righteousness that they are going to receive the land, uh, but as Deuteronomy 9, 5 says, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out from before you. If you want to see some of the wickedness of these nations, read through, I believe it's uh, Leviticus chapter 20 and 18 describes the practices of these sins. Everything from incest to homosexuality to child sacrifice was being performed by these wicked nations. And so God was bringing his judgments on the wicked people of Canaan. Now, it's interesting that most people who have a problem with the conquest of Canaan still teach their kids about Noah's Ark. 
right? Think about that one. In both of these stories, the same principle is at work. God is bringing a righteous judgment against a wicked people. In one instance, he uses the waters of the flood. In the other, he uses the armies of Israel. But both are examples of the judgments of God against the guilty. I will send an angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go among you, lest I consume you along the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people, you are a stiff-necked people, if for a single moment I should go among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. To their credit, Israel mourned. Notice verse 4. The people, it says, heard this disastrous word, and they mourned. Now, at first glance, this may not seem so disastrous. As Kevin DeYoung put it, we might think, you know, it's an inconvenient word, or maybe a disappointing word, but hey, we still get to go to the land of milk and honey. Right? We got a bright future ahead of us here. But notice, to the people's credit, they mourned, recognizing this was a disastrous word. God would not go with them. And so to show their sorrow, uh, to test their repentance, God says that they must take off their ornaments, that he may know what to do with them, to see, will their repentance be sincere? One commentator notes that removing their jewelry represents that the people have undergone a loss that has made them poorer. To have the presence of God was a great blessing, and having lost the presence of God is to lose a great treasure. And so this may be what's represented here. Uh, They represent this by removing their physical treasures. This may also have functioned as a sign of humiliation, of humbling themselves, recognizing things are not business as usual, but things are bad. As commentator Joseph Benson put it, this was a visible sign and profession of their inward humiliation and repentance of their sin and of their deep sense of God's displeasure. Now this truly was a disastrous word. As Moses will appeal later, it was God's presence among the people of Israel that set them apart. It was this that made them distinct from the nations. It could even be seen as perhaps the central blessing of the covenant. Remember God's covenant purpose that I will dwell among my people and I will be their God and they will be my people. To lose this blessing is truly a disastrous word. And this is a good test case for us. Would you consider this a disastrous word? Remember the people, they're still going to the promised land. They're going to receive a land of milk and honey, a good and fruitful land. There is great blessing ahead of them. What does your heart say? Are you satisfied if you can receive the blessings of God with or without him? In scripture, to truly become a Christian is more than to simply pray a prayer, to walk an aisle, or to fill out a card. True conversion involves transformation. The Spirit of God gives us a new heart, causes us to be born again. He grants us new desires. And so one of the important evidences that we have been born again is that we have a desire for God. Right? That we have had the law of God written on our hearts. What is the law of God? First four commandments that we would worship the one true God only. 
that we would worship him as he ordains, that we would honor his name, that we would worship him regularly. And so the born again heart will not be truly satisfied by any of God's gifts if we do not also have God himself. The redeemed heart knows that the gifts of God are only good insofar as they reveal more to us of the goodness and pleasure of God. Without his presence and his favor, to us the richest of foods turns to ashes in our mouths. Without the presence and blessing and favor of God, the grandest of homes, a mansion in which to dwell, is simply a whitewashed tomb. Pretty places, but full of death. For the redeemed heart, it is God who makes life worth living. It is him we are seeking when we enjoy his blessings. For the, for the born again believer, the prospect of God's blessings without God himself is an empty and devastating estate. So examine your heart. Would you be satisfied with the blessings of God without his presence? If you find nothing but cold indifference toward God, if you don't care about worshiping him, honoring him, being in his presence, well, this could be evidence that you have not been born again. Now, I know this is not a pleasant topic, but it is extremely important. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Depart from me. I never knew you. If there are any among us now to whom the Lord will one day speak these words, let it not be said that they were not warned. So hear this solemn warning. If you have no love for God, if you would be perfectly satisfied to receive blessings from him, but do not actually desire God himself, you may not be saved. And so if this is you, then the call goes out, repent, turn from your sin, confess your apathy to God, your sinful desires, and pray that God would forgive you. And the promise is made that to all who truly do repent and believe, forgiveness will be granted. But then we need to recognize that repentance is not a one-time thing. The Christian life is a lifestyle of faith and repentance. And so even if you truly are saved, there will likely be seasons in your life where your love for God, your passion and zeal for him seems to run cold. Now that does not automatically mean you have never been saved, but it is a sin to repent of and to fight against. As Paul says in Romans 12, 11, do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. And so if you have been sinning by disobeying this command, then the call is to repentance. Confess your lack of zeal, your lack of passion and spiritual fervor. Confess that if you have had no interest in worship, no desire to speak of edifying topics with brothers and sisters. Confess if you have preferred shallow small talk to the things of God. Pray that God would stir in you and in this church a deep and abiding passion for him. 
so that even if we could attain all the blessings of the promised land, we would consider it disastrous to us if we lost the presence of God. Let's continue on. Say to the people of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. God's message to Israel is that they are a stiff-necked people. If you remember, the analogy is taken from a horse, a stubborn horse that will stiffen its neck against the reins and refuse to be led by the rider. And so God says, because of their stubbornness, their hardness of heart, their sin, if he were to go among the people for a single moment, he would consume them. So great was their sin and so great the wrath of God that for God to continue to dwell with them would not end well for the people of Israel. So in a way, we can see that the withdrawal of God's presence is a mercy. By pulling back his presence, God is sparing them. For he says, if for even one moment I were to dwell with you, I would consume you. Now, this is another of those passages that's tough for anybody who would deny the reality of God's wrath against sin. You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I would go up among you, I would consume you. You would be destroyed by my presence. I would break out in wrath against you and you would be consumed. God hates sin. Now you may have heard God hates the sin but loves the sinner. Now I think it was R.C. Sproul who put it so well. You really shouldn't take any comfort in that idea because it is the sinner and not the sin that God punishes in hell. God cannot abide sin. Habakkuk 1.13 refers to God as being of purer eyes than to even look upon evil or wrongdoing. What is it that holds back God's wrath from the sinner? If you now are a non-Christian, what are you clinging to? What hope do you have that God will not now in this moment give full vent to his wrath and give you the punishment that you truly deserve? Hear from scripture how God views sin. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. God has given us so much clarity about how he views sin. Now it's true, not all sins are equally heinous, but the fact remains, all sin is sin against God, and all of us have sinned. You have scorned your maker. And so all sin, no matter what it is, no matter how culturally acceptable it may be, is deserving of God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. Your sin may have the approval of the culture right now, but it will not be the culture before whom you stand on judgment day. You will stand before God. And what then will you say? How can a sinful man stand before a holy God? To what will we make our appeals to escape the burning and righteous wrath of Almighty God? Now we'll come back later to answer that question. Continue on with verse 7 for now. Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. So we have a tent here, and we should note, this is not yet the tabernacle. Uh, that has not yet been constructed. And so this was a temporary substitute. Now, what gets confusing is that Moses calls this one the tent of meeting. And later on, the tabernacle also gets called the tent of meeting. Uh, likely, Moses called it this because this is where he would go to meet with God. So notice, this tent was outside the camp, far off 
from the camp. Here we have an illustration of the judgment that God is bringing upon them. Now, if you remember back to Exodus 25, when God originally gave Israel instructions to build the tabernacle, God stated his intention was for them to make me a sanctuary, Exodus 25, 8, that I may dwell in their midst. The tabernacle was to be in the camp, among the people, actually at the very center of the camp. But now with the breaking of the covenant, God's presence is not with them, and Moses has to meet the Lord outside the camp. Those who desire to seek the Lord either for his favor or for counsel or direction, they must go outside the camp to the tents of meeting. Verse 8. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. So God shows that he approves of this arrangement, right? If God did not approve of Moses taking this tent here, God would not have met with him through the pillar of cloud. But God does meet with Moses, and we see here the ongoing mercy of God. Although he was judging his people, By separating them from his presence, they are not completely cut off. God's presence remains within their sight. They can see the pillar of cloud come down to the tent of meeting. Although he will not dwell with them, they know they are still being heard through Moses, their mediator. They still may come out to the tent and seek the favor and counsel and direction of God. Calvin comments, Their separation, therefore, was not such as totally to cut off the hope of pardon, but such as to quicken their anxiety, to exercise them to repentance. The separation of God from the people was meant to drive them to repentance, that they would seek forgiveness and favor from the Lord. Calvin goes on, applies this to us. Thus God often designedly hides his face from sinners in order to invite them to him in true humiliation. And this we must carefully attend to, lest when he chastises us either by word or deed, terror or a sense of criminality uh, should hinder our prayers, but rather let us seek him from however great a distance. Hebrews 12, 5 and 6 picks up on this idea. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, For the Lord disciplines the one whom he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. So if it seems to you right now that God has hidden his face from you, or that he is distant, this may be the fatherly discipline of the Lord. And so if God seems distant, if it seems he is outside the camp, not with you, then examine yourself. Is there sin that you have left unaddressed in your heart? Sin will always hinder our communion with God. And so if you are experiencing this now, then do not neglect the Lord's discipline, but let it have its intended effect. Repent of your sin. Turn and seek the presence of the Lord with fervor. We can see discipline is actually a form of grace. Just as when we discipline our children, our goal is not their destruction, but their correction. And the same is true of church discipline. The church disciplines the unrepentant, hoping that it will shake them up, to to bring them to repentance. 1 Corinthians 5.5, Paul says this of the man who is living in sexual immorality. That the church was to discipline him so that his flesh, that is his sinful nature, would be destroyed and his spirit may be saved 
in the day of the Lord. The goal of discipline is restoration. And so discipline is a form of grace. And we see this discipline appears to have had the intended effect among the people of Israel. For as verse 6 said, they stripped themselves of their ornaments uh, from Mount Horeb onward, showing their continual repentance, right? God says, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. That is likely to test if your repentance is genuine. And the people took off their jewelry, their ornaments, and did not put them back on. Verse 10 also says that the people responded well to uh, Moses meeting with the Lord. Verse 10, when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. The people displayed repentance. They looked to the presence of the Lord and hoped that their mediator could gain favor for them in the sight of God. And from the entrance of their tents, they worshipped the Lord. Verse 11, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. So we see that similar to the tabernacle, which later would be guarded by the Levites and the Aaronic priesthood, this tent was guarded by Joshua, Moses' assistant. He likely served a similar function as the priests later would. Joshua guarded the tent so that nobody would come and defile the holy tent of meeting and thus bring further judgment on the people. Now, verse 11 highlights for us one of the great and unique things about Moses. Look with me to verse 11. Uh, It says, Moses, uh, God showed him, uh, pardon me, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. Now, this does not mean that Moses literally saw the face of God, or even that God has a literal face to be seen. Now, we'll discuss that more as we see uh, God reveal his glory to Moses. But when Moses requests, uh, pardon me, but what it's saying, it is a figure of speech to show how much favor Moses has received from God. It illustrates that Moses is unique in how God reveals things to him. The book of Numbers chapter 12 records the story of Miriam and Aaron when they opposed Moses. You may remember that story. They get a little bit jealous of Moses and they say, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Now God, of course, knows of their grumbling. He summons them with Moses before him. And then God says in verse six, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision or speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. That was from Numbers, I believe, chapter 12. So Moses, notice, is unique among the prophets, for God says that he speaks to Moses face to face. In Numbers, he says he speaks to him mouth to mouth, or as a man speaks to a friend. And that differentiates Moses from all the other prophets who did not receive so straightforward revelation from God. Now Moses is unique among the prophets. And as we've seen earlier in the series, God prophesies through Moses that another prophet like him is going to arise from among the people. Deuteronomy 18 verse 18, God says to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So another prophet like Moses will be coming. God's words will be in his mouth. And as a faithful prophet, he shall speak them all that God commands. 
Now the parallels are, make it so clear that Jesus is the prophet like Moses. John 12, 49, Jesus declares, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Remember, what was it that was prophesied about the prophet like Moses? God says, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak what I command him. Then notice, Jesus says, the father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. The father put his words in his mouth and he was speaking them. Here is the prophet like Moses, set apart from the other prophets in that God speaks to him directly. And brothers and sisters, how much greater is Jesus than Moses? Consider Jesus is no mere man, but he is God, the Son, uncreated, having eternally existed as the second person of the Godhead. And so, if it was God speaking to Moses directly that causes us to need to revere Moses, how much more ought we to regard Jesus? How much more reverence ought we to have for him? He is the very son of God. His fellowship with his father is perfect. He received the spirit beyond measure. He is the perfect and final prophet. As Hebrews 1.3 puts it, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Now we may know Christ fulfills three offices. He is our great prophet, our priest, and our king. Now, for those of us who love the Lord and want to grow in love and knowledge of him, I encourage you, study and meditate upon the offices of Christ. Grow through, uh, to a greater level of appreciation, love, and awe of who Christ is and what he is done and will continue to do for his people. And so that is our aim here. We want to magnify Christ, and so we will discuss his office as our prophet. As the Keech's and Westminster Catechisms put it, Christ executes the office of a prophet in revealing to us, by his word and spirit, the will of God for our salvation. He is our great prophet, the full embodiment of what all the previous prophets foreshadowed. Christ is our teacher, our rabbi, our instructor. He does what no other prophet could do. Instead of only teaching, Christ opens the minds of his hearers to bring them understanding. As Puritan Thomas Watson put it, he is the best teacher. He makes all other teaching effectual. Luke 24, 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Christ is the great prophet, the great teacher, who does what no other teacher can do. As we come to the word to be taught by Christ, he continues this work. Through his Holy Spirit, whom he has given us, he opens our minds to receive the scriptures. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that the words of Scripture, the truths that are here, are spiritually discerned, and the natural person cannot receive them. What that means is that we cannot understand or receive the Word of God unless God moves and works within us. So consider this. If you have received and understood the Word of God, then it is because Christ, your great prophet, has opened up your mind that you may receive and understand it. Again, Thomas Watson says, Others may teach the ear, Christ teaches the heart. All that dispensers of the word can do is but to work knowledge. Christ works grace. They can, uh, they can but give the light of the truth. Christ gives the love of the truth. 
They can only teach what to believe. Christ teaches how to believe. So as we look at preaching, or evangelism for that matter, who is sufficient for a task such as this? To seek to proclaim the word of God. To speak forth his truth. Whether it's pastors and shepherds proclaiming God's word, or friends and neighbors sharing the gospel with their unbelieving uh, with unbelievers, we both face a task that is, humanly speaking, impossible. I can't open your hearts and minds. You can't transform the heart of your unbelieving neighbor. It doesn't matter how well-studied or well-spoken we may be, our words on their own do not have the power to change hearts. And so you, me, every human teacher, evangelist, preacher, anyone seeking to proclaim the word of God in any setting are completely and utterly inadequate on our own. So why bother? Because Christ, the great prophet, continues to speak through his people and continues to open the minds of his hearers that they may understand the word. If you are a Christian sitting here now, you are proof of this. If you have been converted under the preaching of the word, you need to know it was not your pastor's gifts or eloquence or wording things just right that affected you. It was Christ, the great prophet, speaking through his word and his servant. If you have grown in love and knowledge through reading the word or through preaching, you need to know that Christ is the one who has been teaching your heart. He is the one who has opened your understanding. He has continued to speak and to work through his spirit and his word as our great prophet. So let all glory be to Christ. Continue to seek to be taught by Christ. Whatever wisdom or knowledge may be found in earthly teachers or philosophers, we need to know that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2.3. Come to Christ and be taught by him through his word. Pray that he would grant you understanding, insight, wisdom, and fear of the Lord. And be confident for those are prayers that he loves to answer. Christ is our great prophet, greater than Moses, one to whom God spoke face to face. Christ came as the teacher to do what the previous prophets and teachers could not do, which was to open the understanding. And above all, Christ's message was greater than all who came before him, as it was the fulfillment of what all the previous prophets had spoken of, foreshadowed, or warned. Now, if you read through the prophets, you will see they are frequently warning about the wrath of God. You'll see a large portion of their job was to deliver oracles, these warnings of impending judgment. And in our passage this morning, we too saw the problem of the wrath of God against sin. As he said, if for even one moment he should dwell with his people, he would consume them. Well, God's character has not changed. God has not changed how he feels about sin. And as we've established, that's a problem for us. Because we, like every other natural human being, are sinners. And so I asked earlier, what hope is there for the sinner? When we stand before God, to what will we appeal Or has God left us without hope? No. As Mark records, Jesus began his ministry, and like the prophets of old, he began with a call to repentance. Mark 1.15 says, Jesus came proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel, the good news. The good news that the kingdom had arrived because the king had arrived. Our great prophet is also our priest and our king. 
The good news which our prophet proclaims to us is that through his priestly work, he has purchased a kingdom for himself. And if we will repent and believe, we will become citizens of his kingdom. Christ, as our priest, came and offered himself as the sacrifice for sin. It is through his work that sinners may be reconciled to God. For God's burning wrath was poured out on Christ, who died in the place of his people. Isaiah 53, verse 5, He was pierced for our transgressions, He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Here there is hope. Here there is life. If we cling to Christ, we will find eternal life. And so repent, that is, turn away from your life of sin and turn to Christ. Confess your sin and ask for forgiveness, and he will not turn you away. So then, on the day that you stand before your judge, if you are in Christ, you have an appeal. If the accuser brings forward your list of sins, all the ways that you have scorned your maker and sinned against God, broken his law, scorned his holy name, How will you plead? The Christian pleads the blood of Christ. That though we are guilty, Jesus Christ bore our guilt. That though we deserve the condemnation of of death, Jesus was condemned and died in our place. That although the wrath of God continues to burn hot against sin, Jesus purchased our pardon, having taken the wrath reserved for our sins upon himself. We will claim no righteousness of our own, but instead we will stand clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ, which was counted to us, imputed to us when we believed in him. And then our judge would say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of your master. So how can a sinner stand before a holy God? Only through the work of Christ, who purchased their pardon, bore God's wrath on their behalf, and provided their righteousness. By grace through faith, we are made citizens of Christ's kingdom, We are delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. As our prophet, Christ teaches us the will of God for our salvation. As our priest, he has offered himself as a sacrifice, reconciled us to God, and he continues to make intercession for us. As our king, he conquered our stubborn hearts. He rules and defends us and he restrains and conquers all his and our enemies. Let us serve our great prophet, priest, and king. Amen.